we're going to do in the next 48 or so minutes is really have some discussion that comes out of or is based on the research that I did in my doctorate. As I taught in MBA programs in several different countries, the EU, the US, and over in China, um, I would normally utilize in the beginning case studies to, to teach. And case studies are valuable, don't get me wrong. Um, but what I noticed as my students, and these are traditional students all the way up through executives, going through executive MBAs, so it's a real wide gamut of people both in terms of gender and ethnicity and uh, age, uh, also from different countries. Um, I, I noticed that folks were having what I've come to call an ethics out-of-body experience. Um, that is, what case studies are good at doing is sort of pointing out the behavior of others that doesn't match what we'd like that behavior to have been in terms of making good decisions over bad decisions. But the out-of-body part of it was um, that the students, especially the more traditionally oriented students, we're looking at these case studies and going, well, boy, look at those awful, evil people out there that are making these terrible choices that, of course, I myself would never, ever make if I were in this situation, right? Because I can see here what the good and the bad is, all while we're downloading illegal, illegal software, cutting people off on the freeway, secondhand smoking, dot, 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 dot. And what I realized was that what, what, what was wrong with just coming at this subject from the perspective of the case studies that are out there about what people have done wrong is that it really sort of negates the whole idea of decision making and the decision making process each one of us does when we're trying to make choices about anything, professionally or personally. Anytime you make a choice, professionally or personally, anytime you make a choice that has an impact on others now or in the future, it's an ethical choice. And what was happening with the traditional way that we were teaching ethics is that we were sort of bringing the radar screen down to a very narrow focus that had mostly to do with when people cross the line legally or when people cross the line ethically from what is a fairly obvious set of circumstances, but avoiding that larger radar screen that says, well, you know, we could actually think of our choice in cutting someone off on the freeway because we were angry or we, our schedule was more important than theirs or we just wanted to show them our car was faster, whatever it is, we wouldn't put that on an ethics. I don't cut somebody off on the freeway and say, here, watch me be unethical, right? I got all kinds of ways of justifying cutting someone off because my schedule is more important than theirs, or I'm going to be late to this session, or boy, am I angry at this person for driving so doggone <laughs> slow or for cutting me off. I can justify it all kinds of different ways, but what I don't do is place it on a screen and say, boy, that was unethical behavior, or I should say, rarely do I. I've started to. It just doesn't stop me from cutting people off sometimes, but at least I start thinking about it. So I realized there has to be a more effective way to have this conversation. And in fact, one of the few statistically significant things that came out of the research I did, which was about is there a more effective way of having this conversation about ethics, was that the people who received no training, and this training, but I'll just stick with the, uh, that obvious, the people who've received no formal training in ethics are match actually making higher level moral decisions more consistently than the people who have received formal training either in the academic setting or in the corporate setting. Yeah. Now that sort of seems uh, uh, antithetical, right? <clears throat> counterintuitive. I mean, you get training and then you actually make lower level choices. Well, it really doesn't have to do with the people that are taking the training, of course. It has to do with the way the training is offered. And again, this gets back to the idea that inside the classroom or inside the corporate seminar, what we ethicists or we academics wind up doing quite often is sort of demonstrating a whole system of philosophies and ideologies, never really landing anywhere on all of them, demonstrating how people violated those different ideologies that are out there. And by the way, some of them are actually mutually exclusive to one another in making choices. And essentially what was happening is we were empowering individuals to walk out of the rooms, classrooms or corporate rooms, with a set of frameworks in their head where they could make a choice and then find the framework that fit it. Right? So for instance, we could talk about the ends justifies the means as a particular framework in ethics. And of course we know that there are certain circumstances where we actually use that kind of an ethical choice. Like for instance, going to war and sacrificing our best and our brightest is from an ethical perspective the framework of consequentialism. That's academic speak, but literally it means we're using a sacrifice now which doesn't seem very ethical for a greater gain in the future, right? So that's one version or example of what this framework system I'm talking about is. And we're getting lost in these arguments about frameworks. People were walking out of the doors 
using, uh, making a choice and then finding the framework that made that choice ethical for them, rather than finding a framework and making a choice. So that gets me to where we are today and the discussion that I hope to have in the few remaining minutes that I've got to really, to really try and avoid that way of talking about the subject and perhaps go to something that I'm hoping you'll find to be a little bit more effective. And I want to start that voyage off by telling you a story. So this is the story of three entrepreneurs. And they opened up businesses together, wound up in the same strip mall, three different doors, three different businesses. And they've been in business for about a year. And the woman who owns the business in the middle door comes driving in one morning. Things are going well in her business. And she sees over the left door, as she drives up, a sign over her friend's business that says, closing, everything must go. Well, she had no idea that there was any kind of a problem with that business. So she's really scratching her head. But worse yet, she sees over the business, the right door, as she drives up, another sign. And it says, out of business sale, everything 50 to 80% off. Well, now she's really scratching her head because she had no idea that there was any difficulty in either one of the businesses. So she gets out of the car and locks the door, goes inside, thinks about it for a while. She says, you know, I'm going to put a sign up over my door uh, because I see my compatriots here have their signs up. So she makes up a sign, comes out, and hangs it up. <laughs> now. Beyond the ethical discussion we could have over whether that sign was really the ethical thing to do or not, I use this story really as a way of saying, you know, we can watch all kinds of systems closing around us, right? There's a huge close, closing everything must go sale now that's happening in Sally Mae, Freddie Mac, AIG. We can watch these systems failing around us. So I'm not here today to go through this door, which is about relying on the codes and the policies and procedures um, the codes of ethics that we've got currently, because while codes of ethics are really important, they're just an indication of where we want to be. They're not forcing us to be what we should be. So I'm not going to go through the code of ethics door, nor, as I was saying up front, am I going through the right door here, which I'll call sort of the philosophy ideology door, where we could get lost and stay buzzing up in the air all the time, without ever landing on the idea that, in fact, as Cynthia was stating this morning, I was so happy to hear this, there really is a right and there really is a wrong. And ethics is supposed to tell us what the right thing to do is and what the wrong thing to do is. When someone describes ethics as relative, and this is maybe where I start pushing up against some walls, ethics is relative, so it depends on what you know and who you are and the culture you're from and who are we to say their ethics is wrong. That's an example of relativism. When someone says ethics is relative, it's like using the phrase sort of pregnant. Right? You either are or you aren't. And ethics are designed to tell us you're doing the right thing or you're doing the wrong thing. Now, the circumstances and our perceptions may make it very difficult to decide what the right and the wrong choice is. So there is a gray area in terms of being able to see clearly what the right thing or the wrong thing may be. In fact, there are even systems and processes in place in our worlds, whether that's family world or church world or governmental world or national world or global world, there are definitely systems and processes that sometimes actually have such a high price to making the right decision that we have a very difficult time doing it. Like, let's say, for instance, like we saw this morning with Cynthia again, someone who's a whistleblower. Well, a whistleblower knows what the right choice is when they've come across something. So the ethics are telling them this is something that everybody else needs to know. I'm the only one who knows it. I have to make a sacrifice. In fact, perhaps the rest of my career because I get tagged as a whistleblower currently by the system. I'll get tagged as that, but the right <coughs> choice is to do this. And sometimes, of course, we could say that ethical decisions take a moral courage that sometimes has a very high price to it. So I'm not here to say that the circumstances involved in understanding what's right and wrong and the sacrifice made in choosing what might be right over wrong isn't difficult and isn't gray. But the right and wrong itself is, is that. Ethics is not relative. Ethics is about a system that allows us to think in terms of making a good choice that has a positive impact or a poor choice that has a negative impact. We'll talk about what that impact is in a second. Oh, that's a good door. This is actually the tagline from my center. It's out of a Cicilla Box book called Lying, uh, which is a great book, by the way. It's a great one to have a discussion about. Whatever matters to humans, trust is the atmosphere in which it thrives. Again. Whatever matters to humans, trust is the atmosphere in which it thrives. 
Tell me a system out there that lasts over the long term on the basis of mistrust. You may get one that works for a while, but after a while, it disintegrates and falls apart. I think it was Dante who actually said, even the devils in hell, if there are multiple devils in hell, even the devils in hell would actually have to be able to trust one another in order for hell to operate correctly. <laughs> think about it, right? It's sort of the, the, uh, the uh, rule among thieves. So part of what we're going to do today is focus on that idea of trust, which is not a value, it's a virtue. And we'll come back and talk about that in a second. Cynthia spent a lot of time talking about values this morning. I got another V to add to that that I think will help make us understand why even with a certain value, people can make choices that they do. Oh, oh gosh, is it really? Holy cow, am I in big trouble? All right, let me go through this really quickly. Uh, tell you what, I won't give you the academic speak here. I'll go to the bottom line here. If we're trying to talk about the difference between morals and ethics, morals are in the talking and ethics are in the acting. Right? So morals are about the standards we use. Ethics are about the action that demonstrate which standards that we've got. Morals are about talking about the problem, understanding the framework that we might use to solve it. Ethics are about actually doing something. I got another perspective on ethics um, that I hope will be helpful. And this actually comes from an experience I have um, I do some ocean racing. This is my sailboat. It's 40 feet. I keep it in Washington State. And we did a race in 2000 from San Francisco to Hawaii. The race itself was actually pretty boring because we ran into large stretches without wind. Um, and what should have taken us 11 days took us 17 days. And we had food on board for 13 days and seven people. And no, this is not a story about the ethics of cannibalism. <laughs> I sometimes get that worried look on people's faces. We arrived in Hawaii just fine, although we could have a great discussion about the ethics of cannibalism. Um, uh, 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 we arrived in Hawaii just fine. What was much more exciting was the delivery down the coast from Seattle to San Francisco, which is about a 650, 700 mile journey. And we left at the end of the summer, but the coast of the Pacific Northwest coast is pretty wild because you've got the Gulf of Alaska and storms tracking across the Pacific for 4,000 miles. So it's a pretty wild place to be. More shipwrecks would there than anywhere else in the world, by the way. Anyway, going down the coast, we had about three days out of six with 40 to 50 knot winds, which is just a little below hurricane strength, and 20 foot seas, which is just where they're starting to break at the top. Fortunately, they were behind us and not in front of us, so they're pushing the boat rather than us beating into them. But still, it's not fun, it's not pleasant. No one goes out there to enjoy that kind of an experience. We were coming into San Francisco at the height of the storm. It was very late at night. And for anybody who knows San Francisco, Point Reyes sits about, oh, I don't know, 30 miles north of San Francisco. There's a lighthouse on it. You can tuck up behind in Drake's Bay where it's very calm if the ocean's nasty. And we decided, I should say I decided, because there were four souls on board, including mine, and I was skipper. I decided instead of trying to get through the gate in the middle of the night when I've got no local knowledge, we'll tuck in behind Point Reyes and Drake's Bay uh, and stay there for a few hours. When the sun comes up, we'll go into the gate, which is what we did. But we're coming into Point Reyes, and it was m myself and Mike, a good friend of mine, it was our turn to be at the helm and take the boat around the point and, and go to Anchorage. And as we were coming out, we have all our war gear on, our foul weather gear, and this wind is blowing so hard, and it's raining so hard, you really can't hear each other, so we're yelling. But every 32 seconds, I could see the light of the lighthouse, we're about 15 miles offshore, coming out and sweeping through the clouds over the boat, right? So you could see this light. And of course, for me, this was a marvelous feeling, having been out 100 miles offshore in those kind of conditions. We know where we are. We know we're coming home. It was a really wonderful feeling. And I turned to my friend Mike, and I was yelling. We, we couldn't talk because of the noise of the storm. I sort of yelled to Mike, Mike, I can't tell you how wonderful it feels to see that lighthouse there. And Mike, in his rather stoic manner, and he's got about the same blue water experience I do, sort of turns to me and yells out, well, you know, Chris, the lighthouse isn't beckoning us to come. It's telling us, whatever you do, don't come here. Right? Said, well, thanks for the optimistic <laughs> Under the current conditions, Mike, I really needed that. But you know, he was absolutely right. If you're uh, out offshore, a lighthouse is a, is, a, is a place that's telling you, whatever you do, this is not where you want to be. Lighthouses are built on shoals and reefs and cliffs and beaches and, uh, you know, you name it, this is a bad hazard for you. So on one hand, you know where you are. On the other hand, you know you're not supposed to be there if you're getting close. I actually was getting into my journey into my doctorate in ethics at about that time, and I kept thinking about this example. And for me, I actually started thinking about ethics in this way. And using the lighthouse analogy for me is kind of another way of looking at it that gets me out of thinking that ethics are about uh, just the golden rule, I shouldn't say just, but just a golden rule or a code or a law 
that we could really look at ethics like the lighthouse that's there. Because the lighthouse is really doing two things like ethics are supposed to. The lighthouse tells us where we are and, and why we're going. And the ethic, I'm sorry, the uh, lighthouse tells us what to do and what not to do in order to get there. And I realize really that's what ethics are supposed to be doing for us, either per personally or professionally anyway. In fact, uh, I could talk about this in terms of a, a crossing a bridge over a, a river or a gorge in Tacoma, Seattle. We have this bridge, some of you have probably seen it in the 1930s, it blew down, they call it Galloping Gertie, right? It was Tacoma Narrows, and some of you may have seen that footage. Well, there's two bridges there now. I guess two's better than one, but they're good bridges. But they hang over the water there by about 150 feet, so they're pretty far up. And I, and, and I could say, well, you've probably got bridges or circumstances where you're driving in the same kind of conditions to sort of bring this ethics analogy out a little bit more, who would drive across those bridges over water or over canyons um, at 60 miles an hour on the freeway if there were no guard rails on the sides? I mean, you think about it, I'll just use my own bridge at home, Tacoma Narrows, that I cross every day to commute to work. Um, uh, if there were no guard rails on the side, I'd probably pull one car I owned up to one side of the bridge, go out, especially on a windy day, kind of crawl across the grade in the middle and get to my other car on the other side and then drive from there, right? Uh, and, and I suppose there'd be a few people that said, well, I'd like to do it because that's crazy and it gives me an adrenaline rush. But quite frankly, even if you did want to go ahead and drive across that bridge at 60 miles an hour without the guardrails on the side, the people in front of you who stopped their cars who didn't want to do it would stop you from doing it too. For me, this is a more effective, a more useful way of thinking about ethics. Rather than thinking about them as prescriptions or rules or legalities or codes or policies and procedures, you think about them almost like a privilege because it's the guardrails on the side that allow us to do 60 or 65 or 70 or I don't know what your speed limits are, um, that allow us to go as fast and as safe as we can, not just as one person but as all of us that are commuting in a certain direction. It doesn't really wind up being something that penalizes you. I don't think of the guardrails on that bridge as something that penalizes me if I hit them or try and go over them. I would, excuse me, I really look at them as something that allows me to go as fast as I, as, as I can, or at least I should say as fast as I can as safely with the rest of you that are on the road. If you want a demonstration of ethics that I think is far more effective than a case study of someone who's made a bad choice in an organization, think about a four-way stop. Right? Now, I know all of you probably have a four-way stop, or maybe you got traffic circles, same kind of idea. I'll go with a four-way stop. Because what's happening at a four-way stop is about what? It's not about the laws and regulations. I don't get to a four-way stop and think every time I'm there, oh yeah, that's right, Washington Code 57.511-6 says i got to stop here. And if I don't, there's a cop <coughs> that may see me. Maybe that happens once in a while. I don't know about the code number. Really, I, I stop at a four-way stop because I know you trust that I will because I can trust that you will, right? What's happening at a four-way stop is a demonstration of trust. And the fact that you and I do trust each other to stop there because that sign means something to us about stopping there is the way the world works best for us. Imagine a world where 50% of us did not believe in four-way stops, right? For those of us who did, that world where 50% of us who didn't means we'd get to the four-way stop. I don't know if you're one of the 50% on my side who do believe or 50% on the other side who don't, but either way, I gotta, I gotta sort of guess any car coming from the wrong, from the direction that's gonna hit me is owned by somebody who doesn't believe in the rule. <clears throat> so, consequently, I'm gonna wait until the cars are the farthest away as they can be for me to safely go across, and then I'll jam across to get to the other side. Even if you're one of those who doesn't believe in the four-way stop, so you're not going to stop there because it's not good for your life, you need to get somewhere, you're having a blast, you're going fast, whatever it is, you don't believe in it. Well, you've still got kind of the same choice too, don't you? Because <laughs> you're going to go through that four-way stop and you're either going to believe there's no one else that <clears throat> is like you going to go through that four-way stop without stopping so you're safe to go ahead, or you're just going to cross your fingers, close your eyes, and hope you're not running across someone who's just like you. But your life's affected too. So the idea of trust at that four-way stop is really what the ethics are about. And they actually allow us to function together pretty darn well. And for the folks that have a real hard time <clears throat> looking at and understanding universal principles, excuse me, inside of ethics, that's one way of getting out of a discussion 
which could go around and around in circles that, well, one side believes this and one side believes this. There really are universal principles that you and I operate daily with that allow us to do the things that we do together that are based on trust, not just law, and not just belief. So it's kind of an interesting exercise in ethics that are there. I'm not quite sure, so I'm going to leave it up to you. Should I stop talking and give you a case to talk about, or do you want a little bit more framework here from me? And maybe we'll get framework. How many say framework? More framework. How many say talk? No, quit talking. Quit talking. A couple of you. All right. So I'm going to talk just a little more. Give me 10 more minutes. Not going to say talk. 10.5. OK. I'll go through this quick. I'm going to talk about this four B's model. And I'll refer to what Cynthia was talking about a little this morning. In fact, I wrote it down. She was talking about um, that there is sometimes a values collision between the organization and the individual or individuals inside of an organization. And that uh, that third, uh, that, that values like, let's say, loyalty were extremely important to functioning. <clears throat> but even that value is not necessarily enough because it butts up against something else, like what's right or what's wrong. So am I loyal to the company of my boss and keep my job? Or do I do something that I know is right here, right? So there's that values collision. In a 3V model, which is where most of us, or I should say most of our organizations are, we use these three Vs to animate the way that we work with one another. The first one's voice. That's the ability for somebody who starts the company or keeps the company going to see some kind of a future reality and say that's worth going towards. So you got a voice. <clears throat> Second V. Um, I'm sorry, that's a vision, pardon me. Second, you've got the voice, the power to articulate this future and influence others to believe that it can be a reality as well. And then you've got a set of values, which are the strong beliefs that you would come up with together, either wittingly or unwittingly, in order to be able to achieve that vision together. Well, if you think about it, just to take this to extreme, I I've described the, the uh, Third Reich pretty well here, haven't I? Because certainly the leader of that movement, Hitler, had a vision. He saw what the future was supposed to be. He certainly had a voice, the power to influence others to say they wanted to see that vision. And they had a set of values that said, here's how we get to that vision. All right? But we bumped up against the question of ethics, of course, in that, in that extreme example. And I could talk about the examples we were hearing from Cynthia the same way, not that there was necessarily the same level of buying into man's lower nature that may have happened at Worldcom, but in a sense, we still have those three things operating at Worldcom or Enron or Freddie May or Sally, uh, you know what I mean. <laughs> um, and, and so what we have to do is really talk about what underlies or animates or underpins those four, three V's. And that's the fourth V, virtues. The character that drives all of the other three V's that are up there. Right? Doing right for the common good, um, uh, doing uh, right for the common good, and doing good for common rights. Uh, that's what's missing out of the vision of the third right. And that's what's missing out of using values in order to benefit a few over the loss of many. Right? So if you want to talk about where ethics are in, es in essence inoculating an organization against using the first three V's, to make choices that are not about the common good or common rights. It's right here. And ethics is really driven by virtues. If I were to ask people in the room today, what's the most important human virtue? Um, and, and I won't do this because we don't have a lot of time, but I get a, a lot of responses. But undoubtedly, one of the responses I get from someone, maybe many of you, maybe all of you, is that love is the most important human virtue. Right? It really distinguishes us from other things that are out there that are living and animated, um, but that love's the most important human virtue. So maybe I'm going to push up against a paradigm here and say, well, you know, if you think about it, what underpins even love is trust. And in fact, it isn't really love that's the foundation of all human virtues. It's trust that's the foundation of all human virtues. You think about it this way. The people that you love are the people that you trust the most with your, with your most inner secrets. And the more you love them, the more you trust them. Right? So you can love somebody and not trust them, although I'm not quite sure it's the love that we describe as something that's long-lasting. Um, but at the same time, what animates love is trust. So if you want to talk about 
what virtue is the most important in terms of underpinning all the other virtues and in fact animating the values that you have personally or an organization. It's about building trust. You want a simple question to ask yourself when you're about to face a choice that's a tough choice and things seem gray. You can ask yourself what's going to build trust and what's going to erode trust in making this choice. And you probably go a long way towards answering what's the ethical thing to do and, and, and what's the unethical thing to do. And I'm not just talking about the trust between thieves, right? Because ultimately that system's going to fall down and fail as well. I'm talking about the trust between moral agents that actually want to do good and in fact are thinking about the common good and a common set of rights. Or if we want to put this in a phraseology that Cynthia used today, or you've heard before, the golden rule, right? What you want to do for others and what you want to have happen to you. So an interesting way of having a discussion about ethics again without avoiding, okay, well, what's a universal truth and what's not? And who believes in that truth and who doesn't? Because, of course, animating, animating all of our relationships is this, is this significant idea of trust. Okay. Oh. Honesty may be a good policy, but I think we should run it by our legal department. <laughs> yeah, I bet those words have been spoken. So let's see here. I'm going to rush through the first one basically saying knowledge is not wisdom. And I'm not going to give you a long-winded example of this, but of course, having information is not as important as what you do with that information. And sometimes we sort of equate having a code of ethics in place with making the right choice using that code. <clears throat> and the two are not reconcilable always. So it isn't just simply about knowledge, creating an ethics code in the organization. It's about how we use that ethics code how we animate it with the virtues. My guess is most organizations have had a conversation with most of their employees about what values they have. But I also would guess there has been very little conversation about what the important virtues of the organization are. Maybe there's some overlap and they're calling values and virtues. That's, that, that can be a good thing too, because at least you're talking about virtues. But I think in addition to a conversation about the subject of values in the organization, always serving the customer, always being honest with one another. We've got to talk about the virtues that underpin what those values are, what, what, what we think are the most important virtues. So knowledge is not wisdom. How you use that knowledge in, is an indicator of the wisdom that you've got. Or I could put it this way. Ethics are not inside a code. They're inside of us. And I think sometimes we look at a code of ethics as a way to say, well, that's how we're going to get compliance. But ethics aren't inside the code. Ethics are inside each one of us, and that's why it's so important to think about this in a very personalized way. Second thing, let me talk about a framework that may help you think about where decisions are. Kohlberg, Lawrence Kohlberg, out of the Center for uh, Moral Development at Harvard University in the early 70s, asked the question, how do kids understand bad choices and good choices? And as he came up with an answer to this, he put together a model that looked at levels of moral development, and he found it isn't just kids, it's inside of all of us. That's a, long, that's a shortened version of a very long story. But basically, what he discovered are these three levels. Each one of them has different stages. But on the whole, the three levels are what I'm going to talk about. The first level he called pre-conventional, convention meaning rules. More or less, to get out of academic speak, the first level of, of moral development is you make choices based on the idea it's about me. Second level is what he called conventional, it's about some of us. Third level is post-conventional, beyond the law, beyond the rules, having to think beyond what's legal because sometimes legal and ethical don't match, to it's about all of us. And I'll give you a quick example here to sort of walk us through this, but just to give you some explanation to think about it. Level one, I'm going to call this K1, K2, K3, K4 Kohler. K at K1, what happens to me, right or wrong, is interpreted in personal terms. Right? So it's what I think that tells me whether something's ethical or not, and what happens to me that tells me whether it really was. So if I make a choice and something good happens to me, it was ethical. If I make a choice and something bad happens to me, it was unethical. Second level, what happens to some of us happens to me as well. I'm starting to think beyond myself to some group that I want to be associated with. Right? So right or wrong is interpreted from allegiance to that group, whether that group's a, 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 a family, a community, a street, a neighborhood, a, a city, a, a, a nation. We're talking about some of the stakeholders 
that agree this is the way we want to act and not necessarily all of the stakeholders. Our laws in the United States is an example of K2 thinking if you're only using the law to make a choice uh, and you don't understand the difference between the actual written law and what that choice may do to somebody else. So I know it's wrong to steal and the law, t so if something bad will happen to me if I steal, that's level one thinking that might get me to do the right choice. I also know what the law says, and if I get caught, something's going to be wrong with me, so the law tells me I shouldn't steal, so I'm not going to steal. That's level two. Level three is thinking about all of us, beyond the law, Colbert called it. At, at level three, someone who would know the law would also understand that if you stole from somebody, it's not treating them with the same equity that you would want to be treated with. In other words, you don't want something stolen from you. So you wouldn't steal from somebody else. And by the way, the world's a lot better off in terms of us working together to go further if we're not spending our time stealing from each other. So I start to understand what animates these two levels at this level. Now just so I can personalize this, and I'm going to do this rhetorically, let me talk about where our decisions on a daily basis can be mirrors of the way that we see these executives at large companies like WorldCom making terrible choices that have such big consequences. And no one here has to stand up and say, that's me, that's me, that's me. But let me, let me give you an example of something that may or may not touch your heart here. Let's say you're in my class and you've taken my midterm. And I grade the midterm. And in grading the midterm, I actually make a math error in adding the points. And I give you 10 extra points that you don't deserve. So on this last final accounting test that you took, I say midterm, that this last accounting midterm that you took, you got a 95 instead of an 85. That's an A instead of a B, because I made this math error in, in adding the points. What are you going to do? That's a rhetorical question. I think I know where I would come down on that question. I'm not sure I would guess where you would. But I've got a thousand different reasons why I can justify keeping those points that allows me to have an A instead of a B. Who's it going to hurt? How's the teacher ever going to know? Isn't this good for me finally? What goes around comes around, so I've got the blessings of the Lord here. i got all kinds of ways of hanging on to those points and feeling, <clears throat> excuse me, feeling fine about not identifying the problem with the teacher. Let's reverse this. Same midterm. Add the points. Make a math error. Only this time, I short you 10 points. So you get an 85, according to my logbook, instead of the 95 you deserve. What do you do? I'll tell you what you do, because it happens all the time. You're right there at my door, <laughs> right after you've gotten the test back, telling me about this math error that I've made with the points. And if we look inside this, we go, well, isn't it interesting that when the truth was on your side, the answer was pretty obvious about what you ought to do. But when the truth wasn't on your side, boy, the last place in the world you want to go is to the truth. When you can fool around with the truth like that to your personal advantage, that is, when truth isn't helping you, you avoid it. And when truth is helping you, you run towards it. That's the same kind of ethical decision making that these corporate executives are using to make the choices that they're using. Now, I can't say it's exactly the same prescription that's there for making a specific kind of choice, but certainly as easy as it was for any of us in here to go, well, I'm going to keep the points. That's, you know, that's not a problem. Who's going to know? You can hear this language coming out of executives. Certainly, we could talk about executives in the White House, Richard Nixon and Watergate, saying, well, of course we break into Democratic headquarters. Okay, we don't get caught. We're actually doing something that's really good for me, good for the rest of the country. Right? I can justify it all kinds of ways. It's that thinking that we really need to get to the heart of to have a very effective conversation about ethics. And boy, if I run over my time now, okay, last thing I'll do, and then I'll raise some ethical quandaries or ask for some choices. Third grain of sand from the speech, I told you I'd give you a couple of grains. Ethics isn't about information, it's about transformation. And I'll tell you a story. In fact, I think Cynthia mentioned something about drunk, drunk driving just as she was getting off the stand to the stand, I should say, the podium. <laughs> the podium, <laughs> that she was on the stand for a long time. A lot of energy goes into things that aren't ethical. Um, this is an example that I came across about seven years in my consulting experience, and I'll change the names to protect the innocents, but a very large billion dollar a year com pharmaceutical company in Canada developed a drug which they patented that lowers the aldehyde levels of the human body. You think, well, what in the world does that have to do with ethics? 
We produce aldehyde, and I'm going to guess you know aldehyde like from your high school days, formaldehyde, you know, pickles the frogs. The human body actually produces aldehyde when we drink to get rid of the alcohol. We transpire the alcohol in our breath, but it's not alcohol coming out in our breath, it's, it's aldehyde that's coming out. It's not good for the body alcohol, but that's a whole other story. At any rate, we produce this aldehyde. And I think probably many of you have in your states uh, troopers or highway patrol that use breathalyzers. This is if they pull someone over for drunk driving, you breathe into this device and it, and it tells you whether you're over the legal limit or not. Well, the device is not measuring alcohol level in your breath. It's measuring aldehyde level in your breath. So here's a pharmaceutical company that's developed a drug that artificially lowers the aldehyde levels of the human body. So who's the drug for? <laughs> There's real no medical reason to be using it. It's an over-counter drug, by the way. It's legal, it's patentable, it's marketable. There's already a built-in market for it. It's shown to be highly profitable for the company. So of course they're gonna get it out there in the marketplace, right? Because anybody can use it any way they want. They're not telling you drunk drivers should use it. But essentially what it's been doing is empowering drunk drivers to stay on the, to stay on the road. And it isn't even the users of the product that are in the greatest danger from the product, although of course they can have accidents and kill themselves. It's us on the side of the road or in the other vehicles that are actually at the greatest risk because there are far, many, far more, more of us that are not using this drug than there are using the drug that are drunk on the road, at least I hope so. Long story short, three weeks before the drugs to go into the marketplace, so they've already started their packaging, their distribution, their marketing of the drug. Three weeks before it's to go to the marketplace, the teenage daughter of the CEO of this company I'll call Pharmax, the teenage daughter of this CEO is hit and killed by a DUI driver. Will you tell me what happened to the product? Right. Off the marketplace. In fact, the CEO spent two years and lost his job eventually keeping it off the marketplace. I don't know what patent laws are in Canada versus the US. At a certain point in time, this formula will be available to other people out there and we may very well see this drug. But what happened here? Did the ethics of the company change? Was, was the ethical dilemma different before the accident and after the accident? No. The CEO was just simply personally visited by the negative outcome of the product that they were using, which while legal, patentable, marketable, and profitable, did not take into account the incredible downside for all the rest of the stakeholders that were out there. And that incident caused the CEO to go, oh gosh, this is not good, what we're doing is not good, this is not ethical, I'm gonna stop this. You know, it doesn't take a personal tragedy for us to change our ethics, although I'm gonna say quite often when we have a personal tragedy, it does make us visit that place and sometimes we do change. We have the opportunity through free will, great gift, to make that change now, right? The, the old world carpet is being rolled up in a lot of ways, but financially, we've seen that over, over the last three weeks, and this tragedy will make us revisit a lot of different things. But you know what? It didn't take this tragedy to make us visit these, to make us visit these things. We, we had an opportunity to do that long before the tragedy was there. You start animating some of these things with a different set of virtues, with an understanding of trust, taking a look at this three-tiered decision model for where people are making choices. It at least starts to give us some tools to empower us before a tragedy happens to make a better set of choices. So we can use those things as lessons, but really what's more powerful is us making a choice and just to use an analogy from the world I'm coming out of, the sustainable uh, business community world that I'm coming out of now. You know, I keep hearing from people, you know, when, ga when, when gas reaches 12 bucks a gallon, all of us will be looking at all kinds of alternatives, energy, alternative transportation. That's wonderful, but you know what? It's the wrong paradigm. It doesn't take $12 a gallon gasoline for us to look at and invest in alternative energy sources, right? We've got economics driving a much better set of decisions. And so the whole sustainability movement, in fact, is coming up with and getting over that old paradigm, which isn't working for us. We can make better choices without the economics driving us to do it, although it seems to be the main driver right now. So, okay, off my soapbox, way too much time. Um, let me first open it up to questions. And then if we want to sort of have a facilitated discussion, I've got some short case studies and I, we get into some groups and talk about those. But let me ask for questions, comments first. Just on the slides, could you flip back to the uh, three stages of moral development? Mm -hmm. <sighs> Never mind that man behind the curtain. Okay, 
That one? Uh, for that one. Oh. You, you had it. It was labeled pre-conventional. Right. Okay. It's a, this is the same one. This is pre-conventional, conventional, and post-conventional. Got it. Nice. Yeah. Was that it? Oh, that was easy. <laughs> okay, here, I'll, I, I, I see what you're doing now. Let me. I should not have doubted you. That one. That's it. This is kind of simplistic. That drug, did it have any other purpose? Not that I know of. Yeah. That keeps it cleaner. I mean, if it, if it had another purpose, then you would have some discussion about what would be other ways that it could be used. Right, and maybe it becomes something your right. doctor utilizes instead of something that's over the right. counter. Right. Yeah. It's unbelievable that the drug would have been approved by whatever authorities there are that generally approve these things if that was the only purpose. Yeah, and I don't know if that was, uh, first of all, I don't know if that was the only purpose, and second of all, I don't know if that was the advertised I, I would purpose, imagine right? that, there, that there was another purpose. There might have been something behind. I think so. Yeah, I would think that have to be, frankly. I don't see how that could be approved. The uh, thing that scares me about it is that it's not a prescribed drug, it's an over-the-counter mm -hmm. drug, so it's a self-prescribed drug, which I think says something at least about the intent of the people that are putting it out there in terms of how it's really going to be used, utilized, without necessarily saying it. And, and looking at the, the ethical concepts that you introduced there, if, if we have a room full of leaders, um, how would you advise us to try and, and help hold ourselves as well as the others that we impact accountable? to uh, being better from a moral standpoint and, and upholding some of these ethics and trust things that you introduced. Mm -hmm. uh, I'll, I'll do this strictly from a, a very self-aggrandizing position first, and then that's the, at the tree level, and then come to a forest answer. If you, in fact, use this architecture to think about the choices that you're making, and maybe you need more of an explanation of this architecture than 50 minutes can, or 20 minutes or 30 minutes can give us, um, it actually starts to make a difference in the kind of choices that you make. This gets back to what I said up front about the way ethics has traditionally been taught. And I'm not sure if I asked you the question, where did you get your ethics? You could, in fact, exactly tell me <laughs> where you got your ethics. It's kind of an interesting thing that we're just supposed to simply morph into from what's around us. And of course, what's around us currently may not necessarily be giving us a long-term set of ethics that are based on trust. So it's, that's a whole other point of discussion is where we in fact get our ethics from, but the, study that, the studies that I did show that if you actually start thinking about the arch, the, your choices in this architecture, you will at least start evaluating their, their, their negative side and their positive side more effectively than using what may have typically been the way that people thought or were taught about ethics. So that's one way of actually making a difference is to start thinking about the way that you're making a, a decision about something. To go uh, more to the broader level, um, I think that the idea here is that you start enlarging, personally, you start enlarging what's on your radar screen for what ethical choices really mean. Like I said, when you cut somebody off on the freeway or you secondhand smoke or you keep $20 extra change from a store that you, you, you don't deserve because they counted out the wrong change to you, you're not standing there thinking, like the executives in WorldCom didn't stand there thinking, here, world, watch me be unethical. This will be great. Right? That's not what happens. Nobody walks into a corporate boardroom and says, all those in favor of screwing the consumer, making a heck of a lot of money and getting away with it, raise your hand and say, I. Maybe it's an executive session, so it's not in the minutes. But it doesn't matter. No one does it that way. Right? It's done the same way that you say to yourself, and I'm not saying you, someone says to themselves, I'm going to keep those tax points. Who's it going to hurt? No one's going to know. You know, there are a million ways at level one I can justify keeping those points. And by the way, level two, the syllabus didn't say if the teacher makes a mistake, I got to go take the points back. If the syllabus had said something, I would have taken them back. Right? That's level two thinking. What's the code? What's the rule? What's the policy? You can, if you keep your radar small, come up with all sorts of ways of making a choice like that. Who's it going to hurt? Well, what about the three friends you have in the class that would actually have had a B, an A minus, but because the class is curved, which is a whole other ethics discussion, but because the class is curved, wound up with a B plus. What about the recommendation for the scholarship letter you come into my office to get because I know you as an A student when you're really a B student? What about getting the scholarship because the scholarship committee knows you as an A student when you were really a B student? Or the job that asks for your transcripts? 
Ethics is tough sometimes because we don't think about long term. It's not immediate. I can't see it. I don't think about whether I'm going to get a job that I shouldn't because my GPA is going to be higher by keeping these 10 extra points. I don't think about it that way. That's enlarging the radar screen. More stakeholders than just yourself. If you've got a question, so maybe this is at the heart of what tool can you walk out of this room with, ask the people around you. Should I keep these 10 extra points that the teacher gave me? Um, by the way, it may have a negative impact on your grade if I do. What are they going to say? Mm -hmm. Right? What are they going to tell you? You start getting more information, more input. Now, maybe you're with a group of people, this is level two, that says, oh no, we always keep the extra points. <laughs> That's what we do in this group. And then you got to say, well, do I want to be affiliated with that group or not? Because if they were my workers, and they decided, well, we always keep the extra money we get in our traveling expenses. Because that's just the way it works. That's how you get back at the system. I'm not sure that's, of course, this whole trust issue. This is building trust with anybody. So a part of this is, in this architecture at any rate, thinking about the larger set of people that are impacted or possibly impacted by the choices you make. Here's another tool you can walk out with. You may have heard this in some places before. If you're having real trouble deciding inside your organization about making a choice or not, Imagine yourself walking out in the morning, if anybody of us gets a newspaper delivered anymore, in your bathrobe and picking up the newspaper on the lawn, and there's your picture with a, a headline saying, uh, Doctor of Ethics doesn't believe in four-way stop signs, caught at the 25th stop sign after hitting another baby carriage, right? When you, when you think about it this way, do I want to see this decision and my picture in the newspaper tomorrow morning? It starts to make it a little bit clearer. Right? Because again, you've got the other stakeholders now involved that are going to be able to observe the choice and go, what in the world did you do that for, right? All these executives, well, I can't say all of them because the Enron executives had some pretty interesting <laughs> explanations, but I think there were some psychological problems there. But most of these executives are saying the same thing. Boy, if I knew then what I knew now, I never ever would have made the choice, right? So don't wait until the tragedies happen. You want to see this in the newspaper for your friends to see, your family to see, your colleagues to see, for everybody in your organization to follow. That's a pretty helpful prescription that you can think of daily, minute by minute, to decide, hmm, I'm being ethical, I'm not being ethical. It's not the only one, but it helps. Did I see another hand? Yeah. No. yeah uh, the great conundrum to me is, and I reflect upon having heard many speeches and lectures, particularly from psychologists who have examined the same framework and most of them agreed that and I think it was a Dr. Morris Massey who really popularized it uh, who you are is where you were when when you were about 10 years old he, his theory and it's more than a theory I think now is that our gut level value systems are pretty much established by the time we get 10 years old and we arrive as adults in one of these three areas based upon much of our experiences at, at home are. by the time we get 10. And he says, and most of them also say that what changes that would be a traumatic experience of something, uh, uh, some type of trauma. When you're older, you're saying what changes you get older. older. Yeah. yeah. In other words, uh, uh, to uh, oversimplify, I'm honest because I had parents who drilled that into my environment, drilled that into me. When I was 10 years old, I rocked. Uh -huh. I can become dishonest though, maybe because someone has really, somebody I really trusted, really violated that trust, and, and all of a sudden that, that doesn't work, can work the other way too. So, I, my point is that I guess we also have to look for those experiential kinds of reinforcers to us mm -hmm. that say, David, you may have at age 10 and you may for the most of your life been at level one but you don't have to stay there you don't have to say it can go for that yeah you can go for it yeah. and here's the reason and i do think that's the value of classes like uh, like this one i think it's the value of conferences yeah. that hopefully they they border on the traumatic <coughs> experience at least a reminder experience to say you know i've been i've been thinking this way for 50 years now it's time to change. Yeah. And it, yeah so I do think it's you raised two really good points. Um, the first one is, and I didn't really talk about this in the framework, you can make good ethical choices at all three of these levels. Mm -hmm. You're just doing it for a different reason. And the difficulty with the first two levels is you're not always consistent. 
in the choices that you make. Because you're operating on, if it's good for me, it was an ethical choice, and if I avoid, if I'm going to get punished, I won't make the choice. You can make good choices, maybe through your whole life, but there's a much bigger chance you'll at some point go, well, it was good for me. <laughs> I don't really care about you, because it worked out for me just fine, and there was no downside of this. And, and all of a sudden, you're not remembering all the rest of the stakeholders. Um, the other part of what you bring out is really interesting. I'll sort of use learning the language as an analogy. When you're young, language is almost language ability is almost hardwired into us. Little kids, you know, I'm not talking about babies, you know, up through four or five, they get to learn like five, six languages all at the same time. If they've ever been in a multicultural family where two or three languages are being taught, they pick it up like this. Well, I don't know about you, but I, I, learning language now is really difficult. I can still do it, it's just a greater uphill battle to be able to learn it and inculcate it and, and uh, keep it inside of me like it was when we were little. We are hardwired as humans to be more tomorrow than we are today. Some of those capacities to do that quickly we lose when we go from being young to being old. But if I was looking at you now and you were a group of little one and a half or two year olds and I said, is any of you going to be potty trained? Uh, in, the next couple of, uh, in the next couple of months or years, uh, you'd look at me and go, what do I want to do that for? <laughs> this, this is the greatest thing in the world. Wouldn't we all, every once in a while, want to be able to just wear diapers and stay in the meeting without having to rush out and embarrass ourselves and go to the bathroom, right? But we know there's a hard wire in humans to become more tomorrow, even if it's not to your advantage seen at the time. We're still hardwired to, to move further up the chain or wherever you want to look at it. So, I think that's also kind of the ability that we're talking about when we're going from here to here, is, is getting out of what may have been a formal training into something that works better for all the rest of us. And I used up a whole bunch of time doing all this <laughs> and not this. So. Did, did we get to where we want to go? We're good. Great. Thank you so much. I really appreciate it.